Well, with that, we uh, close out the beginning of this part of the chapter where it's a general ideal gas mixture like nitrogen, argon mixing. Now we move into our favorite mixture, moist air. And so we're going to study psychrometrics. Well, when you're introduced to a new word, maybe psychrometrics is new to you, or maybe you're not that familiar with it, you try to look it up. Used to be dictionaries. Now you just look it up online, dictionary, right, at your phone or in the, in the laptop. And uh, it's not to be confused with, and this is always a bad sign, when a term used in engineering can be confused with other terms. So I try to highlight where it can be confusing. So it's not to be confused with psychometrics. If I look at this word and that word, there's one letter difference. What's the one letter? And it's tucked in the middle of the word. It's this R. Hold it. All I have to do is remove that R, and I have a completely different word with a completely different meaning. Looks like it. So psychometrics is uh, psychology, education. Hey, no, that's not us. We're not into that. We're into the study of moist air. That's what we want to study. The other thing is sometimes they'll abbreviate. So if you abbreviated psychometrics, it would be abbreviated psycho without the R, psycho. And then you might think, uh-oh, we got a 1960s slasher thriller movie. Don't get confused here. We're not talking about movies and psycho. But a lot of people will will short, you know, they won't they don't want to say psychrometric, so they'll say the psychrometric chart or the psycho chart. The psycho chart. It sounds like the psycho chart, like a sick mentally deranged chart, but it's not. All right. The other is you may get confused like psych so some people said, I've never seen it, but it played for a while. They maybe saw it original reruns or original series. Or, yeah, okay, there you go. There's a movie. So it can be confusing. So which word is it that is a study of moist air? And we're going to do you raise your hand, and then you're done for the day. There may be more challenging questions. You got it. What is it, A or B? A. A for the study of moist air. Now we cover up that answer very fast because there's a similar question. You may not, you may be, you may want to save your answer. You may want to save your answer till later. All right. Blank is the discipline of psychology and education. Yes, sir. That's exactly right. He didn't anticipate that I would call on him. <laughs> you're out, you're out of the game. All right, now etymology just means the study of the meaning or the roots of the words, and that's how you get the meaning. So do you think the psychrometrics comes from Latin, Italian, Greek, Russian, or German? And if it's Latin, do you think it's something like crazy acting or Italian dark cold or Greek cold measure or Russian cold food? or German crazy air. And then you can just sort of pick some, like psycho meaning crazy, and then psych meaning dark, and then psychron meaning cold, okay, that's like Greek, and then psychro meaning cold, and, uh, or any of these, mix it up. Who would like to take a guess? Yes. C, when in doubt, go with the Greeks. We get so much of our words today, you know, goes back to the Greek. That's exactly right. Cold measure. There you go. You're done. Now we're going to move into air. And we have three descriptions of the air. It can be dry air, saturated air, or moist air. We have done a lot of studies of dry air. It's just made up of no water vapor. It's just made up of nitrogen primarily, oxygen, the next major component, and then some carbon dioxide, etc. Little components. Um, if you look at the air tables, the properties are for dry air, not for any moist air. No accounting for the moisture in the air. So this would be uh, approximately, I use DA for dry air, it's about 79% nitrogen and 21% 
oxygen, and that, that's good enough. Okay? I know there's other components, but if it's 79 and 21, is that mass fraction or mole fraction? What do you think? It's, it'll be the mole fraction. So Y of N2 in dry air is 0.79. And then Y, the mole fraction of O2 in dry air, would be 0.21, 21%. Well, you start to add water vapor into it. Now, this whole chapter is the study of ideal gas mixtures. The nitrogen, oh, sure, I'm convinced it behaves as an ideal gas in air. Oxygen, oh, yes, I'm convinced it behaves as an ideal gas in air. Water vapor, like the water vapor in the room, in this right here, do you think it behaves as an ideal gas? It's in this chapter on ideal gas mixtures, big clue. Yes. It is, it does. It behaves very well, very well as an ideal gas. Okay. So the water vapor behaves as an ideal gas. So when you have saturated air, it's when you have the maximum amount of H2O vapor, the maximum that you could have. Well, let me go back here. If we have the total air pressure would be, I don't know, 1 atm, what is the partial pressure of the nitrogen in the dry air? Wouldn't it be the mole fraction of the nitrogen times the total air pressure? Sure. Likewise for the oxygen. Well, the sum of the partial pressure of the nitrogen plus the partial pressure of the oxygen plus the partial pressure of the water vapor must sum to the total ideal gas mixture pressure. So once we have this saturated air, we have not only is there nitrogen contributing some by its partial pressure, and oxygen by its partial pressure, but now you have the presence of water vapor, and it contributes. It has some non-zero partial pressure. Okay. What could be the maximum partial pressure of the water vapor that it could exert? So P H2O vapor maximum. What the maximum could be? P sat as a function of temperature. It's not multiplied by temperature, but we're emphasizing that the saturation pressure is a function of temperature. This stretches your thermo one background a little bit. What? What is P sat? That's the saturation pressure. It's our oldest friend in thermodynamics. When you're first introduced to the tables, thermodynamic tables, table A2, column of temperatures, the next column is saturation pressure. You are introduced to that plot of the PT, and you went from this point, the TP to the CP. Along that line, what are you plotting? As a function of any temperature, I can get the PSAT. I can get the saturation pressure. It's a point at which it changes phase. But here, it would be the maximum partial pressure that it could exert in that saturated air. Okay. What happens if they describe that we don't have dry air, we don't have saturated air, we have moist air. It's in between. So this is in between the dry air on one side and the saturated air on the other side. This, we're not introducing the concept of humidity, relative humidity, but we're going to get to it today. And that's very familiar to you. So um, that's, that's the, the moist air. So the partial pressure that the water vapor, H2O, exerts is between zero, dry air, and the maximum, it's a saturation pressure at that temperature. Notice, as the temperature goes up, what happens to the saturation pressure? Goes up. When you have saturated hot air, you have a lot of humidity. You have a lot of water vapor in it. Anybody lived in Houston through the summer knows that. You know it. Anywhere in Louisiana, you know it. In El Paso, you do not know this. You do not. In Texas, San Antonio, it's a few days a year, we know that. But the rest of it, we, we are more like El Paso than, than Houston, right? All right. The mass density rho, 
of an ideal gas can be calculated using this equation. True or false? Or do I have an error in that equation? True or false? True. Okay, you got to raise your hand, I get your attention, then you're out for the day if you're correct. Otherwise, you're tormented for a few minutes. Okay, what do you say? True. You're on. You're on. True. True. Correct? Yeah. All right. You're out. Does the mass density, hey, the symbol for mass density is rho, change if only the temperature is increased? So the temperature goes up. What about the total pressure? Stays the same. How about the molar mass of the mixture? Stays the same. How about R bar? Come on. Stays the same always. It's the universal gas constant. Yes, sir. That's right. So rho will, you, your answer is C, decrease. It'll go down. This is the concept of hot air is less dense. And buoyancy, hot air rises. Cold air, dense, sinks. All right. How does the mass density rho change if only the molar mass is increased? So the molar mass goes up. You're not changing pressure. You're not changing temperature. It will increase. Likewise, if this would have been decrease, it would have been decrease. It's proportional, isn't it? Okay. So this is another concept. Let's say I have air down here but I have some H2O vapor being added to the air. All right. The total pressure doesn't change. But what is the molar mass of water? About 18 kilograms per kilomole. What is the molar mass of dry air? Oh, about 29 kilograms per kilomole. That's a lower value, isn't it? So as I bring more water vapor into the air, the total pressure doesn't change. Total temperature is not changing. That's, I'm just thinking of it, just same pressure, same temperature. It's lighter because of the molar mass being lower for water vapor. So when water vapor gets into the atmosphere, where does it naturally want to go? Up, up, up into the clouds. Makes sense to me. Sometimes the obvious have to be explained, right? Hot air rises. Water vapor, when it rises, okay. All right, harder question. One cubic meter, think of a box. This is a box of volume one cubic meter of dry air. Okay, it has so much oxygen in it. I go over here and I have one cubic meter of saturated air. So this is dry air. This is saturated air. Okay, they're at the same pressure and temperature. The same pressure and temperature. The dry air has more oxygen in it than the one cubic meter of saturated air. Is that true? Is there more oxygen? More oxygen in the one cubic meter of the dry air? Or is that false? You already answered. Yes, sir. It's true. Yeah. Because when you start stuffing in the H2O vapor, what happens? It displaces. It has to make room for it. It sort of elbows out some of the oxygen. And it says, hey, look at the total, you look at the total pressure is the is for the dry air is the partial pressure of the nitrogen plus the partial pressure of the oxygen. The total pressure for the moist air, or saturated air in this case, saturated air, is the sum of the partial pressure nitrogen, partial pressure oxygen, plus the partial pressure of the H2O. If this starts coming into play, these two have to go down. And because they're linked, being 79, 21, they're going to go down in the same proportion as you add more and more water vapor and it becomes saturated air, you've got a lot, especially if it's warm saturated air. You've got a lot of water vapor in it. It can be like 2% water. It's like, don't need to drink a glass of water today. All I have to do is go outside and breathe. <laughs> All right, maybe not. So the molar mass of dry air is 28.97. 
the molar mass of moist air that has 2% water vapor, what would that be? I'm not asking you to calculate it, but would it be less than 28.97? Same as 28.97 or greater than 28.97? And D is not a viable answer. I take it off the table. Yes, sir. It would be less than because the water vapor has 18 molar mass, and now it's coming into the mixture. And when you do the math, you find that it's oh, down to 28.39. So we kick around this number good to four significant digits. But as soon as we start adding in water, that really the moist air mixture or saturated air mixture doesn't have the same molar mass, does it? It'll go down from the 28.97. In summary, there's a lot we've already covered. Doesn't feel like it, but we've talked about dry air. No water vapor in dry air. It's approximately 79, 21% for the mole fractions. That's how you get the partial pressure of the nitrogen, partial pressure of the oxygen in that uh, dry air mixture. Now, this could be 1 atm or 100 kilopascal, but if I took a compressor and I just boosted it and put it into a tank and, and now it's 500 kilopascal, the same equations work. The same equations work, even though I may have boosted the pressure. Okay, and we have our molar mass of dry air. Saturated air is the extreme. It's when the partial pressure of the water is equal to our old friend, the saturation pressure, and it's a strong function of temperature. And then we have that mole fraction of water vapor. You could figure that out. It's actually going to push down the, the, the mole fractions of the um, other ones. They'll be reduced, and uh, you can calculate then what is that if, final mole fraction of nitrogen. Well, it's 79%, but it's, it's reduced by the presence of the water vapor. Okay. Moist air, it's some fraction of saturated air's partial pressure. And guess what that's going to be? Relative humidity, but that's coming. Okay. And then you have that the partial pressure of dry air is equal to the total pressure of the air minus the partial pressure of the water vapor. All that seems to be pretty straightforward. Let's continue. Now we've got to talk about temperatures. There's three temperatures. There's our dry bulb temperature, our old familiar temperature. Everybody, that's common. That's If I said, what is the temperature of the air in this room? You'd say, oh, 75 degrees F. You just told me the dry bulb temperature. All right. The wet bulb is another temperature, and there is a wet bulb temperature for the air in this room. From my experience, it's not 75 degrees F. It's not higher than 75 either. It's lower than 75. It depends on how much moisture is in this room. If there's very little moisture, the wet bulb will be a lot lower than the dry bulb. If there's a lot of moisture, like this is saturated air, it'll be equal to. Okay. And then the dew point, everybody has experience. You have less experience with the wet bulb. You have a lot of experience with a dry bulb. You have a lot of physical experience with a dew point temperature. Although, sometimes this one's the hard one to work with, to actually make calculations with. Okay? All right. So, dry bulb, it's the obvious temperature. It's as if we have an outside thermometer, and this bulb down here is just no moisture on it, no liquids on it, nothing evaporating, nothing condensing. It's just a dry bulb. That's the name, how it came about. If you look on the thermometer, oh, there's my temperature. The indoor temperature is 72. The outdoor temperature is, oh, they're reading at 80 degrees. That's our dry bulb temperature. Now, wet bulb, the easiest is to describe it in, in the context of a sling psychrometer. Hey, there's that R, right? Sling psychrometer. So it's a device that has two thermometers, one here, one there, and they put the sensing element of the thermometer, the bulb of the thermometer, down here and down here, and you can, uh, it swivels around this point. With your hand, you would make this twirl, and you would just sling it around and twirl it in the room that you're trying to make a measurement of. And after twirling it just for maybe 30 seconds, you would stop the twirling, grab it, look at the thermometers, and you would be able to look at it. Now, one will be a dry bulb, nothing on the end of the bulb. And when it, 
what you would do is you would look at it and you'd measure, oh, in this room it looks like a 75F or 80 degrees F or whatever the dry bulb temperature is in the room. The other thermometer measures the wet bulb temperature. How does it do that? There's a little uh, cloth sock. Maybe you could see it. It's a little white sock. And that sock is connected to a reservoir with a little cap right here. And you're supposed to take that reservoir cap off, fill it with room temperature water. Not real cold, not ice water, not boiling hot water, just room temperature water. Put it on, and then it, the water will wick up that sock and keep the bulb moist. All right, so when you're slinging it around, what's going to happen? The moisture, it's like wearing a wet t-shirt in front of a fan, right? The fan's blowing on your wet t-shirt, you're going to feel the cooling effect. You're going to feel that evaporation. It'll drop the, the temperature on that bulb that has that sock that's wet bulb. Somebody says, uh, I can uh, get almost too cold in front of a fan blowing on me with my wet t-shirt when it's very dry outside. Maybe you've had that experience. It's like uh, get out of a pool, maybe it's somewhere in dry climate, and you really are, you feel shivery almost. It's drying so much, so fast. It's cooling you down so much. But that sometimes you can get a wet shirt, it doesn't help. You're just sweating as much as the, the moisture is already in the shirt. It's not helping much. Maybe that's more like Houston again, okay? Trying to relate to your experience. So... The When you don't have a large potential for evaporation, when you're slinging it around in very moist air, if it's even saturated air, guess what? There's no cooling effect. It's the same temperatures. The wet bulb and dry bulb would be the same temperature. But when you're slinging it around in very dry, it can be a lot lower. And they'll even have a little gauge where you can run the gauge like this, and they'll say, oh, you're going to read off the relative humidity based on the wet bulb temperature and the dry bulb temperature. I passed these around before, and then one time I passed it around, the bulbs came back broken. I think some friends were having too much fun. Hey, look at this, and it smacked them in the head, the neighbor. And then that was the end of that. So glad it wasn't a mercury-filled thermometer. I'd have called it EPA. It would have been all over the seats and cushions. But anyway, we move on. Why is the wet bulb temperature less than the dry bulb temperature? It's because evaporation from the dry bulb, condensation from the dry bulb, evaporation from the wet bulb, condensation from the wet bulb, or depends, need more information. Professor, it's a lot easier on my brain if you do the talking and I do the sitting. Yes, sir. C. C. There you go. Evaporation from the wet bulb. All right. Next question. Evaporation cools the wet bulb and lowers. I shouldn't write it. Cools, lowers the wet bulb. True or false? True. True. Very good. Evaporation from the wet bulb is more vigorous if the surrounding air is saturated air. True or false? Read it slowly. <laughs> saturated. I'm sneaky. I give you a little softball underhand, then I throw a hard ball down the middle of the paint. 90 mile an hour. Sorry about that. That wasn't on purpose. It just did that. All right. So because uh, I can't have everything true and can't have everything C, then we have to have a false in there every now and then. Keep you on your toes. False. What is more common? The wet bulb is less than the dry bulb. The wet bulb is equal to the dry bulb. The wet bulb is greater than the dry bulb. Or A. A. The wet bulb is less because we don't typically have um, saturated air. All right. When the wet bulb temperature equals the dry bulb temperature, air has very little water vapor in it. The air has considerable amount of water vapor in it or depends. B has considerable it has the maximum amount it's saturated air now one thing is somebody says but doesn't cold air 
actually often in the middle of winter, there's not a lot of uh, moisture in the air, but it's really, really cold, but the relative humidity is really, really high because it's a function of temperature. And just a very little bit of moisture in the air means it's nearly saturated air. So it'll still feel really dry, but it'll have a high relative humidity, but it'll have very low moisture content. Dew point. How many temperatures did we have? Dry bulb, wet bulb, dew point. Everyone has experience with dew point temperature. So you have a glass of ice in the middle of the summer on your kitchen table or somewhere. And what do you have forming on the outside of that glass of cold beverage or can? Dew. Where did that water come from? It seeped through the glass wall. From No, it didn't. No, it didn't. It came from the surrounding moist air in the room, in the kitchen, right? And so what happens is, is the surface temperature, surface temperature is less than the dew point temperature of the room air. There's room air in this room right now, right? It has a, it has a quantifiable value for the dry bulb temperature. It has a quantifiable value for the wet bulb temperature, and it has a quantifiable value for the dew point temperature. And if I have a cold surface, let's say a glass, in this room whose surface is lower than the dew point temperature of the air in the room, condensate will start to come on that. The other is in the winter, you have the window of the house and it's a cold winter day and you're in the warm interior of your house and you look and what is this on the wind, inside of your window? Condensation. Why? Again, the same principle. The cold outside made the glass cold in the presence of the warm, moist air. That temperature of the window is less than the dew point temperature of the room air, hence you get condensation. Basically, the dew point temperature is, if I take that moist air and I start to cool it at constant pressure, it'll get to a point where it starts to dew out, That's like a fog. All right, but if it's in the presence of a cold surface, that's where it'll do out on that cold surface. Oops, there's another example here. It's gone. I don't know where it went to. Okay, when the surface temperature is less than the dew point temperature of the surrounding air, then water will evaporate from the surface, water will condense on the surface, water will boil in surrounding air, or water will evaporate in surrounding air. Water will condense on that cold surface, B. Glasses. I see a few people wear glasses. I've worn glasses. So you have a huge advantage if you're a glasses wearer or if you've worn them before. So glasses fog up. I think we know what that means. Here's a picture of it. So when you go from a warm indoor to a cold outdoor environment, or go from a cold outdoor to a warm indoor environment. Which one is true? Only glasses wearers. Only if you have glasses on currently in the room. Yes, you have glasses on, you qualify. It's A. When you go from a warm interior, let's go with somebody else with, somebody else with glasses. B. Is B, isn't it? Isn't it B? Uh, yes. Uh, if you have cold glasses and then you go into a warm environment, they fog up. So walk out of a freezer, etc. Okay, there's another one. How many people have uh, been in cold climates, cold winter days, and the automobiles around them look like they're just belching out this white wispy? Yes, that's, that's condensate. What's happening? Same thing. So what you have is a moist airstream coming in. And that has a dew point temperature associated with that moist stream of air exiting the tailpipe. And as soon as it starts to cool because it's getting mixed with cold air around it, it'll do and it'll form uh, uh, mo molecules of water will co coalesce together. And it won't be like an ideal gas bumping and rico ricocheting. They'll, they'll stick together and they'll make little water droplets. And for a while it'll hang there and you'll see it white wispy. 
cloud. Uh, a lot of times a uh, power plant will have a big smokestack, right? But a lot of times what's going on in the smokestack is just emissions from combustion. It has a high water vapor content. And then on, on a cold winter day, whoa, look at how much pollution they're putting up. Look at all that junk. Well, it's just water condensation. It's just the same thing, white coming out. Okay? You see black in the middle of the day. Yeah, that's not bad coming out. That's not good coming out of a smokestack. But a bunch of white water vapor in the middle of winter is not uncommon. All right. Okay, this one's a hard one. You have to pay attention. When steam, no, when a stream of blank air is introduced into blank surrounding air, condensate can be seen. So when moist air in very hot or dry air in very hot or dry air in very cold or moist air in very cold. Oh, got to call, got to get your attention and only, did you already participate for today? You ruined your chance to exhibit and all of your friends. Yes. D. D. You have to have moist air and it goes into cold air and it mixes and then you get that. All right, we're getting, see how practical dew point is, dew point temperature? All right, moist air is at 100 kilopascal, 30 degrees C and 84% relative humidity. Relative humidity is 84%. It's really the partial pressure of the vapor divided by the maximum it could be the saturation pressure at that temperature, okay, of the dry bulb temperature. That's how the relative humidity is calculated. So if it's 84% relative humidity, then the partial pressure of the water vapor is the 84% times the saturation pressure at that dry bulb temperature. The dry bulb is 30. We look in our table for 30 degrees. PSAT is 4.247 kilopascal. And so it gives us a partial pressure of the water vapor. Okay. So the air is cooled at constant pressure. Calculate the dew point temperature of the air. So conceptually, we start our air at 30, and we start to cool it. At what temperature? 29, 28, 27, 26, 25. Does it become saturated air? Does it? That's the dew point temperature. You cool it until it's saturated, and that's the dew point temperature. So the P sat at the dew point temperature equals this pressure, which is, what is this pressure? 84 times 4.2. Who, who, who made that calculation on their calculator? So it's 3 point what? 5, 8, 3.5. All right. Round off, give me the temperature, the dew point temperature to just two value, two, no, no interpolation. Okay, I'm going to call on somebody, your chance to shine. Who called it up? Did you participate yet? Did you, you want to answer? What's the dew point? This is probably the hardest question. Oh, oh, look at that. Now, now it's the hardest question. 27, congratulations. Excellent. Did you see how the calculation is done? It's a little tricky at times, but it's conceptually pretty straightforward. Conceptually, you start with your moist air and you start to cool it. And as you cool it, the partial pressure of the vapor doesn't change. But P sat, because you're cooling it, is going down until they match. And that's the dew point temperature, the dew point temperature. So, uh, you find the actual partial pressure, and then you ask yourself, at what lower temperature does the saturation pressure match that current partial pressure? If that's not confusing, I don't know what is. I mean, it's very confusing, so take your time, right? Go slow. Three temperatures. What were the three temperatures? Dry bulb, easy. Wet bulb, okay, I'm thinking of that sling psychrometer. I'm thinking of evaporation. Cooling, evaporative cooling. And uh, dew point. I have a lot of experience with it, but sometimes it's tricky to work with. So think about this as a, let me let's see this. 
it's that partial pressure of the water vapor is equal to the saturation pressure at that dew point temperature. So in this room, somebody could come in and they say, I know I'm going to measure the dry bulb, I can measure the wet bulb, and I can measure the dew point temperature. Okay, is it possible that the wet bulb equal to dry bulb equal to dew point? True or false? Somebody raise their hand. Can all three of those temperatures be equal? Uh, you got to raise your hand and call. We got rules. It is definitely true. So if the wet bulb is equal to the dry bulb, then how is the dew point temperature related? If the temperature of the wet bulb is equal to the temperature of the dry bulb, is the dew point less than the dry bulb, equal to the dry bulb, greater than the dry bulb, or we'll take away D? One of those three is correct. Why do you wait to the hardest one? You are right. You know that? You waited to one of the hardest questions. All these easy ones, they were raising their hand. <laughs> yeah, this was a hard concept. So all three of those temperatures will be the same when it's saturated air. And as soon as any two of these are the same, the third has to be equal to. You can't have, let's like, say, two but not the third. Pick any one, any of them. You know, so temperature, dry bulb, temperature, wet bulb, temperature, dew point. If these two are the same, guess what the wet bulb is. If these two are the same, guess what the dry bulb is. See? So it only happens when it's saturated air. Now we get to two humidities. One you have a lot of experience with. I could probably you could probably do a pretty good job of assessing the relative humidity of the air in this room right now. Anybody want to give me their wild guess close to the nearest 10%? I don't want anything, you know, either it's 10%, 20%, don't tell me 22.3%, right? Don't, you know, nothing like that. 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, right? In increments of 10. So who would like to give it to me? Yes. It's right around 60%. I couldn't agree better. That's perfect. I would say if we got and measured it, it would be about 60. If it's over 50, I can feel it a little bit. All right? If it's not up in the 70s, you would be miserable. Or 80s, you'd be like, out of here. I, I'm out. Done. This lecture isn't worth it. Okay? Uh, well, some of you are saying that, but don't leave. <laughs> but you have a lot of experience. This is the one reported in the newscast, right? All right, so what exactly is relative humidity? It's a ratio of the mole fractions, but that's not the way we use it because everything's an ideal gas. This is the way we use it. It's a ratio of the partial pressures. So it's the, the ratio of the, the partial pressure of the water vapor in the current state to the maximum that it could be, which is the saturation pressure. All right? All right. But it really is a ratio of mole fractions. The mole fraction currently to the maximum mole fraction of the water vapor if it would have been saturated air at that temperature. Now the other one is all Greek. Look at that. It's a Greek letter. Well, this other one was Greek too, phi and omega. But humidity ratio, this one you probably are not familiar with, but it's the one engineers love because it makes sense to us once it's explained to us and once we start using it. This one we like. We really like the humidity ratio. So what is it defined as? It's defined as the mass of the water vapor divided by the mass of the dry air. Notice, it's not, it's not equal to the mass of the water vapor, H2O vapor, divided by the mass of the moist air. That's not what it is. It's divided by the mass of the dry air. It'll have units something like uh, kilograms of vapor per kilogram of dry air. All right. So if I have a cubic meter and I say in this I have, I don't know, let's say uh, uh, 0.982 uh, kilograms of uh, dry air. And I have uh, 0 
uh, one eight kilogram of water vapor, how many total kilogram of uh, moist air is there? It's it's what? It's 1.000. If I did the math right, I'm just making these numbers up, right? Does that look? Is that okay? Did I make a math error? Or is that good? All right. The question is, is what is the humidity ratio for this condition? Is the humidity ratio answer A? Is it equal to 0.018 or answer B? Some other value. And if I had my calculator, I could calculate it. It would be 0.018 divided by 0.982, whatever that is. It'll be less than 0.018. It'll be 0.017 or something. Which one is it? Hey, we don't have A or B, but I'll call on you and you'll tell me. We can still play our game. See, all the eager beavers have been knocked out. And now I'm getting down to like, I can't, I got to pull teeth like a dentist. Come on. A or B? It is B. It is B. Now, I don't have a calculator. Let me get mine. And what is that numeric value? Did anybody run it? I don't have a calculator. But it's, it's less. It's a little bit less than 0.018. Okay. Yes. Of of moist air. So this is dry air. So it's like the dry air is just the nitrogen and the oxygen. This is just the H2O. This would be the kilograms of nitrogen, oxygen, and H2O. That we mean by moist air. Everything. All right. All right. Now, uh, the humidity ratio is, this is the definition. If I divide both numerator and denominator by the common volume, I turn it into a ratio of densities. So rho, density. All right. Then I can replace the density of the water vapor. Oh, that's easy. We just did that a couple times, didn't we? Isn't that the partial pressure of the vapor? The motor mass of the vapor divided by R bar T? Sure. How about the density of the dry air? Isn't that the partial pressure of the dry air, the molar mass of the dry air divided by R bar T? Put those in, and you do a little cancellation, and what you find is that the humidity ratio boils down to the ratio of the molar mass of the vapor to the molar mass of the dry air times the partial pressure of the vapor divided by the partial pressure of the dry air. This, most people forget, and then they just remember that ratio of 18.02 divided by 28.97 is 0.622. And they almost like forget where that comes from. I don't know where 0.622 comes from. No, it comes from the ratio of molecular masses. You have a calculator? Pull it out and try it. 18.02 divided by 28.97. And then they truncate this 0.622. All right, and then this is the partial pressure of the water vapor in the current mixture, and this is the partial pressure of the dry air in the current mixture. Sometimes they'll write it like this. Omega is 0.622 PV divided by P minus PV. What? Why did they write it P in the denominator? P minus PV. That's how they get the partial. Because remember, the, uh, the pressure... Total is the partial pressure of the dry air plus the partial pressure of the vapor. It's almost too easy, isn't it? All right. Well, do I have enough time to press on or are we out of time? We have about 10 minutes, so let's keep going. More calculations. Rub out the answer quick. See? You can't see it. You didn't see it in time. No way. So we have moist air, 100 kilopascal, 30 degrees C, 84% relative humidity, our old friend. Air is cooled at constant pressure. Calculate the humidity ratio of the air. Well, you don't need this anymore. You just say, what is that humidity ratio of the air at these conditions? Uh, I remember that equation, 0.622. And then I need PV, and then I need... 
P minus PV, all I need is PV to stick in this equation, was the partial pressure of the vapor. It's so relative humidity, 84% times the saturation pressure at what temperature? Dry bulb. What was the 30 degrees C? So we have did this before. We calculated that to be close to 3.57, right? So now what you do is 0 0.622, 3.57 divided by 100 minus 3.57. And you should get a number like that. All right? Well, I feel like you are burned out. Do you feel burned out? So we're going to vote. We voted. Done for today. Thank you for your attention.